director of one of the units of the National Research Council, and he's here today to tell us about the activities of the National Research Council and the National Academies of Science. Here he is. Thank you, Sean. Good morning. Good afternoon. How many here are familiar with the National Research Council? Scientists. Scientists? That's not the same as National Research Defense Council. National Research Council, yeah. NRC. Okay. What about the National Academy of Sciences? More familiar. Same thing. Anyway, I'm here to talk about the history of both of these organizations and some of my experiences in working with the National Academy of Sciences. Well, it all began with an eccentric British scientist named James Smith, and I just noticed that there is a book there. Hold it closer. It might be better to put it on the collars. Yeah, it's a little too close. How do you attach it? Sorry. I'm being decorated. James Smithson was an eccentric British scientist, and I noticed there's a book that Sean put out, which I'll probably take out when I go upstairs. And he left his entire fortune to the United States of America for some oddball reason. He never came here except in death, and Alexander Graham Bell took his body and put it in the crypt in, in the Smithsonian's castle. But it all really began with Joseph Henry, who was a scientist who discovered self-inductance. In fact, the unit of self-inductance is the Henry. He wanted to start an institution that would honor American scientists. So he and a bunch of scientists prevailed upon Abraham Lincoln in March 3rd of 1863 and had the Act of Incorporation for the NAS, the National Academy of Sciences, signed by Lincoln. There were two provisos. One, that any time the government had problems, technical problems, they could call upon the National Academy of Sciences to provide advice and it would be free. The second proviso, the quid pro quo, was that the Academy would be placed outside of government. Unlike the U.S. Supreme Court, which is part of government, obviously, the Academy is outside of government because most of the problems are going to come from government agencies and they want to separate the two. Well, early studies were not very profound. One of them, for example, was the quality of the on the board U.S. warships. <laughs> the other was, should the United States embark on the metric system? I don't know how the committee ruled on that, but obviously the government didn't buy it, except to put the metric system on milk cartons and a few roadsides. <laughs> Another interesting uh, study was how to prevent compass deviations from ironclad ships. So they didn't have much to do for a long, long time until the advent of World War I. And in 1916, Woodrow Wilson's administration was flooded with technical problems. So they turned to the academy and inundated them with all these problems. So the academy established the National Research Council, the NRC. And now the academy was bifurcated. One group, the NAS, honored prominent scientists and the NRC and the working stiffs, and I was one of them, who worked on technical problems. Well, in 1964, the engineers said, you've forgotten about us. So they established the National Academy of Engineering, and both the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Sciences both worked through the National Research Council. And then later on, in 1970, the doctors said, why are we aborted? That's a bad point. Why are we aborted? How about honoring us? So they started the Institute of Medicine, the IOM. They work not through the National Research Council, but their own organization. Now, the Academy is made up of many, many boards. And I'd like to read off a few typical ones, because as soon as you hear the title, you'll know what their mission is. Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate. Naval Studies Board, Air Force Studies Board, Transportation Research Board, when 
when I was there, that was the largest in the academy. Board on Global Health, Space Science Board, Board on Chemical Sciences and Technology, Board on Physics and Astronomy, Board on Science Education, Food and Nutrition Board, Board on Radioactive Waste Management, and the National Materials Advisory Board, NMAB, and that was the organization that I belonged to. How was the study initiated and conducted? Well, the first thing is that the staff scientists, let's say the National Materials Advisory Board, will meet with the liaison representative of the government agency that has the problem. They'll discuss the problem. The staff scientists will go back to the academy, write something up, to get permission to conduct the study. It cannot be a trivial study. I mean, the, the Battelle, Columbus Battelle, and Battelle Northwest, and those think tanks can handle those, but these have to be something of really national import. Otherwise, the academy will turn it down. After he gets permission, a budget is prepared. <laughs> acceptable to the government agency, a contract is signed. Then the staff person, the staff scientist, has to decide who best would serve on a committee to solve a particular problem. And he, for example, I'm a polymer chemist, and I know some of the people in the field, if they need a chemist on, on board, I might have somebody in mind. Otherwise, to get recommendation, you go to other places within the academy or you call up the scientific journals, or you could also go ahead and uh, ask people within the government to name some, some people. You'll make phone calls to get their assent to serve on the committee, and then you have to write up something on each one of the individuals who will serve, saying why you need their expertise. Now, it's never happened to me in my career there that the academy said, we don't want that guy, because that would be very embarrassing to disinvite somebody. There have been times when they said, we really don't like that person, and we know and say, it's necessary to have him. He has a special expertise and we need him. Well, the secretaries of the NMAB arrange for hotels, airplanes, and flights, uh, and other arrangements for the people who are going to come to serve on the committee. These people get no honorarium. I got an honorarium. Sean gave me this beautiful cup. <laughs> Why would they want to serve? Well, the young scientists don't want to be left out of these very important matters, obviously. What about the Nobel laureates and the people who have established careers? Well, they do it for love of their country, sense of duty. Well, the very first meeting, the committee will hear what we call the Lincoln speech, the kind of thing I'm giving you today. And then the liaison representatives, could be more than one agency interested in the same problem, will tell what the problem is, what they would expect from the committee. And then the committee chairman might, at the very first meeting, hand out assignments to individuals on that committee, asking them to do some research or write something up. And then the committee meets, usually every other month, and how long will they meet depends on the complexity of the particular Eventually they write a report, and there's an in-house editor at the Academy, or at the NMAB, who will edit the report, and then it goes to outside reviewers for peer review. They can criticize the report, send it back to the committee, and the committee may agree to changes, or may not. Then the report is printed and given to the government agency that sponsored the project. Now the Academy also has its own press, it's called the National Academy Press, and generally they'll sell copies of reports unless they're classified. Now it's interesting that 9,000 reports from 1863 to 1997 have been digitized by Google. There's been a contract between the Academy and Google to digitize all the reports. And they think by 2011, all 11,000 reports will be digitized, available to any of us when we get on the internet to read these. All right, let me tell you about my experience. I think I'm building on the, on the roster. Okay. Okay, the first thing I ever... Oops. 
The first thing I never worked on was a project called Skirts and Seals for Surface Effect Vehicles. Now, what is a surface effect vehicle, an SUV? Well, think of the hovercraft that flies the water between England and France through the English Channel. It's a ship that has these long skirts that are all around the circumference of the hull, all around the perimeter of the hull. And there's a blast of air that's contained between hull and skirts that lifts the hull right up the ship right out of the water. So therefore, it goes along on the tips of these skirts with much less friction than the hull in the water, and it can attain very high speeds. The surface effect vehicle is very similar, except it's more powerful. Not only does it go over water, it goes over logs and rocks and over land. And of course, this was a daily sponsored project. You can visualize it later back in mind for undertaking such a project. Well, the committee and I went down to Panama City, Florida. I cannot remember any longer the name of the company to take a ride on one of these things. We did, and it's terribly noisy. It's unbelievably noisy. Now, when I was a teenager, I worked in downtown Manhattan in a very noisy factory, pre-OSHA days, and lost a lot of my hearing. Then I was in service and in civilian life around airplanes, I lost some more hearing. This one put the finishing touches on the <laughs> So if there are any questions, say them out on the voice, otherwise Priscilla's going to have to interpret for me. Well, it turns out that the Navy never really undertook a large fleet of these things, but they, there was a serendipitous effect that the Canadians found out that when this thing went over ice, a foot or two thick, it broke it up. It was so powerful a blast that it could serve as an icebreaker. That was my first project when I joined NMAB in 1975. The next one that may be of interest to you has to do with liquefied natural gas. Now, I rode on that SUV vehicle. This is going to be another exotic vehicle that I rode on when it comes to bringing liquefied natural gas, LNG, into the United States. The great fear the government had was that these super tankers that were being built to bring in liquefied natural gas from Algeria were going into Boston. And if there were an explosion, Boston would have been devastated. So they looked to build facilities along the west and east coast in more safe regions. The one we toured and investigated was at Coke Point, Maryland. And it was not too far south of the Calvert Cliffs nuclear plant and not too far north of the Tuxen River Naval Air Station. It was not as bad as Boston, but it wasn't probably the safest place. A very modern facility was built on the land, and an unusual way of bringing super tankers into Chesapeake Bay was to have not a pier go all the way out, but just a docking place over a mile from land. And the ship would dock there, and the LNG would be offloaded through a pipe that went under the bay to the land where it would be regasified and distributed to the states along the East Coast. Well, you had to be able to get out there through this tunnel. Also, you needed to go through the tunnel for maintenance in case there were a leak. So I rode on it, and it cut me about 100 bicycles. And I rode on one of these through the tunnel. I can't remember if I went all the way out and back again. So that was my second experience in riding in a esoteric vehicle, an SUV and a bicycle. There was a dispute in those days with Algeria, and so they didn't bring in any LNG, and the plant stayed idle for a long, long time. And I think it was 50% owned by two companies, and one of them was Columbia LNG, which now completely owns it, and it's up and operating again. Moving on to another project that NMAB worked on, and I was a staff officer with, was causes and prevention of brain elevator explosions. <coughs> Continental Brain Company in West Waco, Louisiana, on December 1977, right about Christmas time, the plant blew up, the silos blew up. 36 were killed, including six FGIS employees, Federal Brain Inspection Service employees. It destroyed 48 of 73 plant silos. And these silos have walls of concrete that are from thick. They would throw a thousand and thousands of yards away from the facility itself. Almost at the same time, that 
same Christmas, 1977, in Galveston, Texas, another side of the world, again killing 18 and 6 FGIS employees. So in an eight day period between December 21st and the 28th, there were five explosions in the United States, and there were 15,000 grain elevators in the United States, so these were very frequent occurrences. So the Inspector General of the United States, particularly since federal employees were killed, said, we ought to do something about it. Let's turn the academy and start a committee. So we put together a committee, and we all trooped off to Kansas to see what an elevator was like. But when you go into these elevators, you always see some grain dust on the floor or on the machinery, even though they try their best to get rid of it. And if you talk to some grizzled old workers there, I've been in this plant smoking cigarettes for 25 years and nothing's ever blown up. <laughs> or a welder would tell you he's never had a problem. <clears throat> so it turned out to be a matter of education there. They wanted to show that grain dust could explode. Grain itself has a high water content, doesn't burn very easily. So what the committee had done was take a box about the eight baby with a spark plug, your ignition source, a few grams of, of uh, grain dust, a fan to the airborne, a hole in the box with a cover, maybe aluminum or plastic for a vent, and when they let that spark ignite that dust, there was a tremendous explosion. <coughs> Proof positive, let the dust blow up. So the committee came to the conclusion that it's very difficult to get rid of the fuel source. You do the best you can to keep the elevators clean, so you really have to go after the ignition source. You couldn't really prove that lightning or static electricity was a cause. They did speculate about that. I think the report helped because there weren't as many explosions after the Academy put out its report, but they still occur. As a matter of fact, ADM, Archer Daniel Midland facility blew up in 2008. Just like to digress for a moment. <clears throat> when the Academy returns the report with its recommendations to the sponsor, does the sponsor have, the sponsor have to follow through and accept its recommendations? Obviously not. They don't always do that. As a matter of fact, when Reagan came into office, everybody was worried about their agency being cut. He was going to cut back government. So what they did was they went to the academy and said, study our, our work, and we hope we got our fingers crossed that the academy gives them a seal of approval. So there were some political reasons for going there, hoping they, they would come out with the right recommendation. But I want to tell a story about one truly good study with a great outcome. In the early days, the, the academy was asked to find out whether the US government should undertake the SST a supersonic transport. <clears throat> the committee people said, no. When it goes over land, it'll create a sonic boom and disturb all the habitats down below. And it'll never pay for itself. It'll be much too costly. Well, the Brit I'm sorry, <clears throat> the British and the French undertook the Concorde, and that plane has not flown since 2003. So one for the Academy.
Then later on, the terrorists uh, took RDX, very powerful military explosive, and they molded it in with plastic, made plastic explosives, molded it into a very thin sheet, put it in a lining of luggage, so that if the x-rays came at right angles, they didn't have much of a path to detect it. And so you had to use something that was akin to a CAT scan, where you had x-rays coming in all different directions, different intensities, doing a slice at a time. And an algorithm on the computer would put it all together and say, some suspicious there. Okay. Well, and the terrorists in all fields are always one step ahead of the good guys. They then went to liquid explosives, which are peroxides generally. In fact, I could make some of that stuff right in my own home. Uh, what was his name? Richard Reed, the shoe uh, bomber, had that in his heel. Okay. And that's why, of course, a lot of liquids were banned, and still the large quantities of liquids are banned when it was carry on. So it gets to be really a problem. But the real problem is with the carry-on people break through. At one time, let me just say in advance that there are some techniques that are really great. Some very large instruments have now been put down into small size, so they're amenable to be put in airports. The limit of detection gets to be lower and lower and lower. Fantastic. But the problem is sampling. How do you get that stuff into the machine to detect it? Well, at one time they had things called puffers. People got into this as they went through. They put them in there and they puffed the thing and then this vapor would go into the machine. But that didn't work too well. Number one, people were claustrophobic. Didn't, didn't even last very long. And number two, it, uh, it took too long. It didn't meet that seven or eight seconds per person thing. Now they have some low intensity x-rays like there is. If you saw 60 minutes on Saturday night, Sunday night, the complaint is it sees through clothing. I don't want my lumpy body to be seen on the screen. Anyway, it was a, an eye opener for me because in 60 minutes it said that they don't save the photo. They don't identify who it is. It's on the screen in a room that's separate from where you go through. And so that has some possibilities. But it's, the thing that really was interesting how they TSA, the Transportation Security Administration guy, couldn't really say on television, we don't really have a good method for people going on. Right? He couldn't say, look, I was stuck. I'm telling you that, so get out of this room, don't spread that. Okay? Don't have a great fear of it. It also was very annoying when this uh, false, uh, this, I guess he was on drugs at the Water Airport recently. Everybody complained that, oh my God, we had to wait two hours to get on it. But if a plane blew up, they'd all say, why aren't, why isn't TSA doing something about it? Anyway, that gets to be a real problem. That's about all I want to say about that one. It's ongoing. We were the first to look at that, and that must have been around. It was before 9-11. Uh, it was when the Lockerbie, when the Pan Am went down to Lockerbie, when an Indian airplane was bombed and, and destroyed over the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so that was the first committee to look at ways of finding out whether bombs are being brought aboard commercial aircraft. That's still going on today. Well, the NMAB at any one time only had five or six of us as scientists. I was a polymer chemist. We had a ceramist. We had a metallurgist. So we couldn't cover everything. So some things would come in that would fall in the cracks, and what would happen, the executive director would say, who's interested in this problem? Who thinks they can handle it? So a problem came in called conservation of historic stone monuments and buildings. The Taj Mahal is downwind from refineries. It's getting, it's starting to deteriorate. Angle Wat is getting buried in the Cambodian jungles. The Parthenon was hit twice. Once, when the uh, Ottoman Turks stored ammunition there, and the Venetians bombed it, and it blew up. And then, of course, our good friend Lord Elgin came on and stole the marbles, sold them to the British Museum. And now the Greeks are building a museum demanding to get the marbles back. Lots of luck, Greeks. And then, of course, there's a sphinx. Sandstorms have made a mess out of that. And 
And beyond that, Napoleon's soldiers, when they conquered Egypt, they would cut shots at it. So I volunteered. I said, hey, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go to these places. <laughs> so I became the staff officer. Well, it turns out the committee we put together was so expertise in this, they didn't have to go to Chip the Sphinx. So where did we go? I went to Battery Park, to a abandoned U.S. Customs building. And I'm a New Yorker. Well, that building now, it's a beautiful building, that building now is the New York version of the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian. There's one in Washington that had opened up about three years ago, I guess. Something like that. So anyway, I didn't get to go on these other trips. And just one other thing about that committee. The chairman had a great sense of humor. He called it the Committee on Stones and Bones. <laughs> well, I finally did get to go overseas. In the 1980s, the Japanese were well ahead of us fabricating electronic components, making chips. And there was a man named Moore who promulgated a law, Moore's law, that said every two years, the amount of information of the number of transistors on the chips will double. And the Japanese were fulfilling this and the Americans were not. So DOD was worried about this and other agencies were interested in it. So we sent a committee over to Japan. And in five days, we visited seven companies. We visited, visited Hitachi, Mitsubishi, <coughs> Sony, Sharp, Fujitsu. And we saw how they had uh, put together the chips. They were heavily supported by the Japanese government. Put a lot of funds into it. And we went to one of the plants. I don't remember which one it was. I had very sophisticated equipment. We donned white suits as if we were walking on the moon or picking up investors from a destroyed building. Went into a chamber where the last of air got rid of all the dust on our body because any of that dust that gets into a chip will just ruin the chip. And maybe I'll just briefly say that how are the chips are made. You start off with silicone, absolute, or germanium, absolutely pure, and you make a wafer about the size of a dish. It's not conducting. Then you go ahead and you make it into a semiconductor by implanting certain ions in there to make it slightly conductive, make it a semiconductor. Okay. Then you have a mask that you put on there, and you could use photolithography to make the pattern on the face of this thing. And then you etch it where the mask has covered it, it'll either take it away, or maybe where the mask didn't cover it, the etching solution will take it away. And then they slice this up into many transistors. Into many, many chips. Okay. So, the committee saw all of this and reported back in their report. But it turned out in the early 1990s, in the 1990s, the Japanese suffered a very severe recession from which they haven't recovered to this day. And now, of course, with the newest recession, they took a double hit. So that they're no longer are in the forefront, and Intel, American company, obviously, is the leading chip maker in the world. So we've won by default. But I think we learned a lot from that trip. <coughs> the next thing that might be of interest to you is counterfeiting. And that's interesting. I think it's Martin's Ferry. Just recently, two guys were caught handing out bogus bills. It's not a real threat in the United States. The threat is overseas where another country who doesn't like us will print off, print many, many of these bogus bills and pass them out, hoping to wreck the U.S. economy. So the committee got together to come up with some ideas of what to do about that. So you'll notice that as of 1990, a lot of new things were, were done, not in the one or two dollar bills, because the one or two dollar bills is not that important. Just say something about how counterfeiters may work, just like the people who bring bombs aboard aircraft, the terrorists are always one step ahead of the government. The paper on, on our bills is a very, very special paper, made by only one company, and it's classified, and they're not allowed to sell it to anybody with the U.S. government. It's a very special paper. So the counterfeiters will bleach the one or two dollar bills and transfer them into higher currency. Or, 
what they'll do is take a one dollar bill and add a zero or two zeros into a ten or a hundred. Or they'll take a two dollar bill and add a zero into a twenty. And I looked it up, I don't think we have a two hundred dollar bill. Okay. When the FBI came to the committee, they had a bogus bill that was made on the Xerox machine. And we're talking about a 1985 Xerox machine. Color was just coming out, and it wasn't very sophisticated. And they were amazed how good the reproduction was. A trained eye would not accept it, but some poor checkout clerk at Kroger's would look at it and not think twice about it, particularly if they were very busy. So, what they did then with the bill, not the ones and the twos, but 10 and higher, they put in a security thread, they put in some watermarks, they put in Italian printing, that's always been there, it's sort of raised, you can feel it when you put your fingers on the belt. And they also put in color shifting ink. Okay. Now, I'm going to pass this around. And you can see all these features in the bills. Sean, I'm going to pass around twenty dollars, so don't let anybody out until I get that back. Lock the door. My <laughs> flashlight. You have to put it behind the flashlight. So let me tell you what's going to happen as I started here. I have two ten-dollar bills. The one that has uh, Hamilton's face inscribed with the lips is older than the one that leaves that out. The newer bill has more color in it. The newer bill has, in this particular case, the top of the Statue of Liberty, and another one here. The $20 bill has an eagle, and the original bill does not. If you shine the light behind it, you can see the security thread on the left-hand side running vertically. On the 20, it's on the right-hand side. If you shine it on the right-hand side, you can see another portrait, the watermark, of Hamilton again. If you look at the denomination in the lower right hand and you look at it straight, on the newer bill it looks gold, on the older bill it's green, and if you tilt it, they both get very dark. That's the color shifting ink. And there's a lot of features like that. This very fine printing along the forehead, you can't see it except with a magnifying glass, but that stops people from Xeroxing it, even with sophisticated scanners and nowadays and sophisticated Xerox machines. So, I want my twenty dollars back. <laughs> Shine the light behind it. Is that just a flashlight, or is that a special kind of light? That's a rechargeable light. That's just a it's a plain, plain old flashlight. I mean, if the light here were better, you could hold it up. You can do that at home with your bills. Hold it behind and look at the vertical thread on the left side. Yes. I mean, what about the pen they use in the grocery store to make sure your bills? I'm not sure what that. They'll mark it with a pen. I'm not sure. Maybe that's it that goes over the entire printing, which is raised, but I think the bills always have that. I don't know. I've never seen them do that. Maybe. I don't know. I'll have to find out about that. Okay. Um, let's see what it was like. Okay, well, that's an ongoing thing because there are many, many proposals to go ahead and make it even more secure. Now, things like holograms don't work because you need stiff medium for that, like a credit card. Uh, the other thing I was going to mention is that you'll notice that the portrait of the president on all these new bills is offset because these bills are creased when you put them in a the wallet and that will destroy the features of that. So that's an ongoing thing. Let's see what we have here. Oh boy, I'm really racing ahead. Um, there was another foreign trip that I took. It wasn't with the committee, but it was NMAB business. The Chinese government wanted somebody from NMAB to come. They wanted my boss to go there and give a talk on material science. He couldn't do it, so he sent me. So I went there with uh, money from UNESCO, pocket money from UNESCO. Everything paid for by the Chinese government for the flight from Dulles to San Francisco, where I stayed overnight in Shanghai to Beijing, where I was going to give a talk at Xinhua University, the MIT of China. Before I went, I went to the Chinese group at the academy, and I said, give me a phrase to start my talk, like, you know, 
I love your egg rolls and I'm happy to be here in China. <laughs> so they gave it to me and I practiced it over and over again. When I got to San Francisco and got on a plane to Shanghai, there was a, there was a Chinese aircraft. And I asked somebody there, a young Chinese person, listen to this phrase that I'm going to give in this speech. So I said it very slowly, and he said to me, I don't understand a single word you said. <laughs> well, this was a really weird trip. It was a great trip, it was all paid for. They assigned a young Chinese scientist to take me around the country. He was just married, he's 25 years old, just married, so we were called the odd couple. He didn't speak any English, and I, all I knew was a couple words of uh, saluting with a, with a uh, whiskey glass. And the Chinese in those days, we're talking about in the 80s, uh, very few people went there. Tourism wasn't a big thing. It was filthy. Filthy, the electricity failed all the time. So I gave this speech in January, the coldest month, in an overcoat. When I asked him, how long can I speak? They said, as long as you want. I said, what do you mean? I said, well, there's only two of you at this symposium, a Japanese scientist and you. It turns out the Japanese scientists didn't show up. So I, I was there alone. I figured, well, I'll give about two hours worth because I know polymer chemistry and I know chemistry, but the ceramics and the metallurgy part that we did, I had to wing it. I knew a little bit about it, but not enough to go down that long. Well, the interpreter got bored. He left after about an hour. <laughs> And then when the questions came, I had a lot of a devil of a time understanding what they were saying. But anyway, it was a good trip. I got to see the Great Wall, Tiananmen Square, the Forbidden City, the Ming Tombs, and then we moved on to another city where I didn't give a talk, but I met scientists and they were asking me, uh, what about chemistry, polymer chemistry in the United States? And they told me what they were doing, which I found, in most cases, was way behind the U.S. effort. And then the highlight of the trip was to go to Xi'an, which is somewhat inland, where the emperor who started the Great Wall and the Great Canal had tens of thousands of life-size terracotta soldiers buried in the ground. And some farmers, I think in the 70s, while plowing, discovered these, and they've been digging them up ever since. And they put them in a museum with a glass cover on the top. And that exhibit, some of that exhibit had been in the United States, about 10,000 of them, but maybe 50 of them. And it's coming back again. And I think the nearest place, maybe Washington, D.C., where you can see them. Anyway, uh, just a quick funny story. Uh, they were selling in the museum in Xi'an, where these uh, life-size terracotta statues were, little ones. And my friend who was taking me around, Somehow or other, we were able to communicate on this trip. Uh, he said, no, 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 don't, don't buy it in the museum. Go out on the street. I have a little one at home with the dust of Xi'an still on it. And in those days, when you went to China, there were two currencies that don't exist anymore. The yuan, which presently exists, and what we call funny money, which foreigners had to use. It was worth more to the Chinese merchants than the yuan. And so, person on the street who was going to sell me this said, wants funny money, and my guy said, no, no, don't give him, I give him the young ones. Well, the difference was like 75 cents for the statue versus 80 cents. He probably thought I was a rich American, I said, no, 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 well, let's give him the funny money. <coughs> well, the rest of the story is funny. We got back to Washington, and I noticed in um, upper, Walker, uh, upper Georgetown, where we have uh, an NAS facility, <coughs> There was a Chinese shop, and in the window was this huge terracotta statue. So I asked the woman, how much do you want for this? She said, oh, it's not for sale. But we've got little ones in the back. I said, how much are the little ones? She said, $75. <laughs> and I said, oh, I paid 75 cents or 80 cents in Xi'an. She said, no, no, these are from Beijing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, uh, I think I'll stop at this point and just show you some slides that will illustrate some of the things I've been talking about, and then I'll entertain some questions if there are any.
other way. Showing, uh, I, don't, I can't read my notes, but 
course, that's Lincoln. I think it's, um, I think that's Joseph Henry, third to the left. It's either third to the left or third to the right. But since you never met Joseph Henry, what do you care? <laughs> He's there. And that's the signing of the NAS Charter. This is the Great Hall. It's a beautiful building. And you can go to Washington anytime there's not a meeting in that building. They'll let you go. There's usually artworks. You can walk around and see all the great features there. Hanging from the ceiling, and you can't see it here, it is a Foucault pendulum, which hangs from the ceiling. And because the earth rotates, the pendulum will precess above the floor. And I believe the next one in another view, yes, another view of the Great Hall. It is an absolutely beautiful building. This is a nice looking staircase that goes to the top of the auditorium. Here's the auditorium. Great acoustics. They have free concerts there. Very popular classical music generally. In this auditorium, by the way, they had a panel that was looking into the Challenger disaster. The Challenger disaster, you may recall, blew up on the pad, killing the astronauts. And so they were discussing uh, possible cause. And Richard Feynman, Nobel laureate in physics, asked for a glass of ice water right here on the stage. They brought it to him, and he took maybe an O-ring, or at least a piece of rubber like the O-ring, and dumped it in the ice water and waited a while. Took it out and crushed it in his hand. It became so brittle. He said, that's the cause of the failure. The liquid, the oxygen, the cold temperature hit the O-ring. Brilliant man. I wish I had more time to tell the anecdotes about the Richard Feynman. Quite brilliant and funny man. This is uh, President Obama this year speaking at the Academy in that very auditorium and promising to fund scientific research at a greater extent than had been done in the past. Now, in that main building, very few meetings or committees take place. Very few uh, room there. And so, a long time ago, when I, when I was there, in the beginning of 1975, <coughs> we had meetings on 21st Street and Pennsylvania Avenue, in appropriately named the Joseph Henry Building, which was part of the campus of George Washington University. But the university raised the rent to such a great extent that the academy fled and they went to the northern part of uptown, Georgetown, which this is the, really where the working states have most of their meetings, up at Georgetown. Now this is the West Coast facility. This is the Beckman Center on the campus of the University of California at Irvine. And underutilized, as a matter of fact, when we put together the committee looking to expose us on commercial aircraft. I had a devil of a time getting a chairman. And so I met a, a Dr. John Waldeschmiller from Caltech for lunch in New York, and he said, I will serve if every other meeting is out in California. I said, great, the Academy wants us to go out and use this underutilized center. So we did that at every other meeting there. Um, there's also a Woods Hole Center, Woods Hole, Massachusetts, Cape Cod, and it's a delight to have a meeting there. And it's over here in the summer. I think I only went there once for the committee. I got my money back. <laughs> no interest? No, <laughs> uh, This is the, uh, this has been. Uh, this is the Miriam Koshlin Science Museum, which was constructed uh, after I had left. I've never been there. There's a slight admission charge to it, but it belongs to the Academy. This is the headline of what I talked about, about these uh, Gulf Coast explosions. This one is in Galveston. I guess this is the early headlines of three persons believed killed more than that. Oh, wait, well, that's, it. that's the paper behind it. Eight killed there in a last, and this is an idea of the destruction of the grain elevator.
this is not exactly the explosion that the committee put together. It's uh, the same simulation, but it's lycopenium powder, which is similar to a grain, and it shows you uh, what a few grams will look like after it's ignited. I didn't talk about this project, but the, we had a, a project that had to do with preserving records of the National Archives. That is a, a terrible problem of, of what to do. Uh, in the 1800s, a lot of the documents were printed on acidic paper. And if you take it out and you breathe on it, it goes flying around. So the committee, to say it briefly, uh, found a gaseous basic chemical that would neutralize the acidity. And so you put these things carefully in an autoclave, subject them to this gaseous uh, basic component and neutralize the acid. But they did have a couple of explosions. This is that beautiful uh, U.S. Congress building, which is now the Museum of American Indian. And you can see how nice a building that is. Look at the inside of that. That is really neat. And I think coming to the end, this is an SEV. You can see the two powerful fans behind there that cause the loss of hearing. So now if there are any questions I will entertain answer them or remember the SEV factor. Well, I really enjoyed my experiences at the, at the Academy because you can see there were some very, very interesting problems. So I thank you for listening and will to answer questions. Yes, sir. I was wondering, on these long-standing committees, do they shift around uh, committee members or do people stay on these same committees for... I think it's limited in general. There may be some, not to my knowledge, to my knowledge, but generally after the report is out, they're finished. Unless there's another mission for that, I'm trying to think. Sometimes, for example, that one on brain elevator started out as a committee on hazardous materials. And the Inspector General said, hey, that committee exists. Why don't we talk to those guys? And so they made a subcommittee. So some of the members served there. But I think that, for example, John Baldwin, who headed that explosives committee, he wrote a report, a classified report, and then they went on to do another study, but in the same uh, venue. Do you mean though the committees he talked about, like the national, the different boards? No. No, I guess the individual. No, the individual. Even the board each each board has a board to oversee what they do. We even go on retreats and say, because sometimes the government will come to us for problems, and other times we'll say, you guys want to work on this. Okay. Yes, sir. In 1980, in China, when things were so primitive, could you have predicted how? Why they would come so fast? Mm -hmm. I could predict Mao's death. That was one thing. I don't know if it ever could you ever shot me coming along. Could you ever imagine? Way. Could you ever imagine it? It's hard. It's hard to imagine. Of course, it's a, it's a country with lots of talent. Of course, a lot of population, a lot of population problems too. Uh, but looking at at least the polymer science there was very primitive. But you know, I wouldn't be surprised. It's just the same thing with the, with Brazil. You know, it really hasn't come to the forefront yet. You would say. One of these days, Brazil is going to be a powerhouse when they get their act together. Yes, ma'am. It seems like our country is spending an awful lot of energy, intellectual energy, and effort on um, smaller and smaller computers and gadgets and things like that. But meanwhile, um, previous speakers spoke about how our highways are now at the end of their lifespan as well as many with thousands of bridges. So it's baffling to me that we spend so much energy and gadgets, and, and yet some major structures in the country are the end of their lifespan. We're talking cell phones, iPods, and all those things. Yeah, all well, the gadgetry, yeah. As opposed to really looking at the bridges and the roads. Yeah, I don't think I don't think the government is directly involved in that kind of thing. It's a commercial enterprise, which is separate from, you know, spending talk money on highways and bridges and all. So I'm not sure that that's really a problem. Different domains. People like gadgets. I don't own a cell phone. I don't want one. If I want to disappear. I don't want anybody to call me. The <laughs> question back there. Uh, scientific reports um, put together by government scientists uh, have become uh, hot issues and some 
impressed by the political superiors of those uh, scientist employees. Uh, what is the avenue, if any, since NRC and NAS is a non-government organization, uh, if there's going to be a report, let's say, on the evidence that validates are really a problem and it goes out in the public, where, where, how does that find its way back to regulation by EPAs and the Well, I'd say some of the reports are just ignored by the government agency. They made a good point to work for the EPA in my time after I retired from the academy. And lately, EPA and some of the other agencies, or I hate to say that the Bush administration, have overlooked what their internal scientists have said should be done. They just went ahead and they changed wording in certain reports and just ignored actually what the in-house scientists have said. Now, as far as the academy goes, they have no lock on saying you must do this and must do that. It's recommendations and it can be taken seriously or not. If it's paid for by taxpayer money, it makes you wonder uh, why is it even being done unless uh, the government itself is going to be reading these reports and paying some attention to them and have an obligation to do it. Otherwise, it's an exercise in futility as far as I'm concerned as a taxpayer and a citizen. It's a real, it's a political problem, not really a technical problem. I mean, we can see what's going on right now with the deadlock uh, government trying to solve things like, uh, uh, well, if they believe it or not, global warming or the euphemism about uh, climate change or stem cell research and all. They're in loggerheads. It's the politicians that really can't get together and, and do anything. But the academy will see the stem cell research, what they recommend, may or may not be carried out or you know, any of these other enterprises. When you have a group like the people at a place like Mattel, yeah. you said that only national problems or problems of national interest would be dealt with by the Academy and other things would be funneled out to groups like them. Uh, is it ever does it ever happen that when they're working on some problem, it becomes obvious that it has national significance and it's transferred to? No, I, I don't think so. The, the government can also turn to Patel because they may have expertise in the area over the years. Also, we have had people from Patel serve on academy committees. Have a number of them who do that. Too. But I don't think it's ever happened that the uh, Patel will be working on a problem that's in national interest, and they do do that and turn it over to the National Academy of Science. I don't know why we don't remember that ever happening. You had a question? Uh, yes. How did you happen to, to come to Wheeling? Uh, well, I had a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I used to work for U.S. Steel Research in Monroe. That went belly up. And then I went to Washington, D.C. for 16, 17 years. And I thought, hey, let's cash in on this very expensive condominium in Arlington, Virginia. Where do I want to retire? And since I knew this area, and I love the city of Pittsburgh, I want to settle near Pittsburgh, but not in the city itself, which has kind of taxing problems and all. And I remember really from the old days. I used to play golf at Old Bay all the time. So I bought a nice house. It's an anti sticker shop when I moved from Washington to um, really. So, and it's, if our politicians would get their act together, this could be a great place again. There's so many good features of Berlin. Yes, ma'am. This is kind of a follow-up to the questions already. Um, does the National Academy ever, does it have like a media, does the uh, National Academy of Science or the NRC, do they have a media representative so that when this junk science goes out, they speak in major media outlets, newspapers, network channels, and try to clarify saying, no, our report did not say that, or this was our true finding, and a quick follow-up question to that. Do you ever meet, like, or does the panel of the National Academy of Science ever meet with the president and his advisors for congressional people and, and talk to them and say, this is what we found? Because it seems like they get it wrong a lot. Yeah. Well, the first part of the, the, the question, there is a publicity group at the Academy. And I actually got on the phone and said, <coughs> well, Priscilla and I went to Washington. We went down to the building with a camera. And unfortunately, they had a meeting and they wouldn't let us in. 
So I couldn't get all these pictures. So I called him up, and they have a publicity group there. And he said, oh yeah, we'll send you. So some of those pictures you saw, I got from that. Now, if you pick up the newspaper, maybe not the local newspaper, although there may be eight pages of dispatches in the local newspaper, very frequently you see National Research Council. I mean, I have a bunch of articles here. So they're in the news very, very often, particularly with stem cell research, climate change, uh, the coal issue, energy issues, you know, alternate energy, and so on. But would they ever specifically refute a certain accusation? I know they're, they're widely available, that information. Right. But for instance, when the news reports something as if it's fact, um, does the National Academy feel responsibility to refute a, a specific assertion? We actually go to uh, the representatives of the president himself. Right, right. right. I'm not sure. I wonder if they use I wonder they send copies of the reports to the White House staff yeah. and do that. I don't really think so. Okay. I mean it's I'm not sure if it's pertinent to this particular question, but one time uh, Goodwill said we want to make use of some of our old clothes, so uh, can we do an academy study? And so we went to the staffers on the hill and sat down with them and they said, Well what's this about? Well they have some old clothing and they don't know what to do with it. What do you presently do with it? We make rags out of it from mechanics. They all laughed and said, it's not an academy problem. So at least we talk to people on the Hill sometimes. But I'm sure they're all aware of what the reports are. They're well publicized, they have a publicity department there. And now, as I said, Google will have all of these things on the internet. So you people, if you're interested in anything beyond what I said today in more detail, you can go and read the executive, executive summary of these things. So things are changing very rapidly in the use of modern uh, innovation. The, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Let me take this in with you first. Oh, I think it's maybe silly to ask, but I often wonder has there ever been any, any information that would suggest that counterfeiters often, or maybe it's, they sometimes have worked for the government in that department that make, makes money, so they would have the expertise about the classified. Who are these people here? No. Is there any evidence that people who are counterfeiters have ever worked for the government so that they're familiar oh. with the classified information about making money? <laughs> I mean, they worked for the government once and now outside right. the government, they know some of the secrets. Right. I can do that. I don't know about that. You know, I think there must be a law about indulging if you're a government worker in, in uh, something you know something about. I wonder what the logic was for turning down the metric system in uh, 18... Uh, <laughs> I wonder, since they digitized even those old reports, maybe it would be nice to they go on the internet and look and see what... First of all, let's see, did they recommend going to the metric system? Yeah. Uh -huh. you know, they 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 it down. Well, it's pretty tough, you know, so for example, if you're into the sports, what are you going to say, first down and 10 yards to go, or first down and 3 meters to go? <laughs> In England, it's still a mile on the road. That's the only thing remaining. Yeah. Well, remember, they made a switch with their money when you had all of the, the pound and the shillings and all of that, which was complicated. They went to the metric system. And uh, we could do it, too. But, you know, it's somehow or other. Well, Na NASA wishes we had. They do? <laughs> well, they had the, uh, one of the Mars missions fail because they didn't translate between oh. uh, American and metric units. Uh -huh. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> you have a question? Um, if, if this is a good idea, don't anybody steal it. But um, <laughs> you would think that today, as far as the money goes, that there could be something that they could put in the bill that since so many businesses use scanners, that when the clerk could use it, you know, immediately could just scan the bill and it would register whether it was. Yeah, that's that's been thought of. Yeah, to have the machine make the decision whether this is bogus or whether it's real. You know, it's costly, and voters would have to have something there at every time and all. But that's been thought of. They do something like that. Something in the bill. And it should be easily done, though. Yeah, because, I mean, you think if they can get a UPC code and tell whether it's right. I mean, you'd think that's it would be fairly easy. That's been thought of. I'm not even sure they have to modify the bill, but they can go ahead have uh, a serial number, perhaps, or what have you. Did everybody get a good look at those bills and see the security thread and, and the other features? What, what bill? 
<laughs> you owe me ten dollars. Could I take them home to look at them? Take a look at the twenty, by the way. How different it is than the ten? And so on and so forth. Other questions? Well, thank you very much for the time. is served.